So one vocabulary term that we need to define first is hominid, and that's a word that will be repeated over and over again through this mini lesson. Um, a hominid is a primate of the family hominidae that includes humans and their fossil ancestors. There's about seven different features that really define humans or characterize them as primates. The first three are ones that relate to the skull anatomy. For example, humans have forward-facing eyes, which allow them to have binocular vision. Uh, they also have larger brains, which helps to improve cognition. And the skull is adapted for an upright posture because the foramen magnum, the hole where the spinal cord passes through the skull, um, faces downward. There are also three characteristics or anatomical features of the hand that help to define humans as primates. First, humans have opposable thumbs, which makes it capable of a power grip and precision grip. The finger pads are also, um, the finger pads also have nails instead of claws, and this improves tactile sensitivity or the uh, sensation of touch. Lastly, our hand and forelimb is able to rotate. Lastly, humans have flexible shoulder joints. The shoulder blades are on the backside of our thoracic cavity, um, and that allows us for additional movement. A change in habitat in Africa about 2.5 million years ago may have prompted the emergence of Homo sapiens from forest to savanna. This necessitated a change of diet to include more meat, therefore more protein, which helped to increase the skull capacity and brain size of hominids. This improved diet quality provided energy to support greater brain function and learning capacity. Activities resulting from this improved cognition, such as group hunting and cooking food, enabled hominids to eat a wider variety of food. This is Ardipithecus ramidus, one of the oldest known hominid fossils, which is found about 5.2 to 4.4 million years ago in the range of Ethiopia. It has a brain capacity of about 375 to 550 cubic centimeters. Major anatomical features include a large upper and lower canine for a diet of fruit, leaves, and insects. Next up is Australopithecus afarensis, which existed about 4.0 to 2.5 million years ago in South and East Africa. The most famous of this is Lucy, which is also the most complete skeleton found about 3.2 million years old. The skull anatomy shows a 380 to 430 cubic centimeter skull capacity and smaller canines for a more omnivorous diet. Here we have Australopithecus africanus, which lived about 3.2 to 2.5 million years ago in South and East Africa. The skull anatomy shows a capacity of 435 to 530 cubic centimeters low forehead, and large molars. It was a small game hunter and moved from trees to the savanna. Here's Homo habilis, which lived from 2.4 to 1.6 million years ago throughout parts of South and East Africa. Its brain capacity was 700 cubic centimeters, had a reduced brow ridge, lighter jaw, and smaller digits, and it also was one of the first hominids to use stone tools. Then is Homo erectus, which lived from 1.8 to 0.1 million years ago. It migrated to Asia and Europe about 2.2 million years ago. The skull capacity is about 880 cubic centimeters. The skull is also has thick bones, which leads to the formation of the external nose. The use of fire and rudimentary language is suspected. This is Homo neanderthalus, which lived 200,000 to 330,000 years ago in Europe and Western Asia. 
The skull capacity was 1,500 cubic centimeters. It had a long, narrow face with a broad nose and brow ridge. It was known as a cave dweller, buried its dead, and used flint flake tools. Which brings us to Homo sapiens, or modern man, which appeared on Earth about 140,000 years ago and exists all over the world. Our brain capacity is about 1,440 cubic centimeters. We have a flatter face, pointed jaw, and reduced orbital ridges. Our species is known for cave painting and primitive religion being developed. By comparing the different types of hominid fossils, we can identify key evolutionary trends. First, we have a more downward facing foramen magnum in the base of our skull, which is caused by a transition to bipedalism or walking on our hind feet. Our S-shaped curvature of the spine is an artifact of an increasingly erect posture. A lower and broader pelvis, because bipedalism has changed the hominid birthing patterns and behaviors. Also, a change in relative lengths of arms and leg bones. Our arms have become relatively shorter and legs relatively longer due to walking upright. There's also been a trend to the increased size of our heel bone and alignment of the big toe. These changes in our feet to become greater weight-bearing structures. Our faces are now flatter with reduced brow ridges and jaw protrusion, causing our head to be no longer the most anterior or forward part of our body. A larger cranial capacity with increased brain size and greater encephalization, uh, which allows us for have, having a greater intellectual prowess. We now have smaller teeth and our jaws are more V-shaped, reflecting changing dietary requirements with less emphasis, emphasis on tough vegetation. There's a reduction in our body here. Our improved hunting and cultural practices have led to the development of warm clothing. And lastly, a shift in our muscle groups, particularly the gluteal and hamstring groups, to accommodate our new mode of locomotion. Several species of hominid may have coexisted at the same time. For example, Homo habilis may have coexisted with various species of Australopithecus. Homo neanderthalus likely also coexisted with Homo sapiens. There is great incompleteness of the fossil record in terms of human evolution. Fossilization is an exceptionally rare occurrence that requires an unusual combination of special circumstances. Starting with the fact that most living things tend to decompose rapid, rapidly or be scavenged following death. Also, fossilization tends to favor hard body parts such as bones, teeth, shells, and so on. And exposed fossils will soon be weathered or destroyed. Also, only a small percentage of fossils have been discovered for hominids because fossilization favors species that were long-lived and widespread, which is not the case for many human or hominid species. There is great significance of the incompleteness of our fossil record. Individual fossils are not always representative of the entire species as variation exists among all individuals in a population. There's also very few complete skeletons that have been discovered, and so paleoanthropology is a very inductive or data-poor science. Lastly, many conclusions have been drawn on limited data and are frequently reinterpreted in light of new discoveries.